tribute to the Negro Baseball League. This is an exhibit by the National Pastime and the Negro Leagues, uh, and they're going to be doing several different exhibits over a period of time. But one of the myths we want to dispel is the fact that the Negro Leagues was the biggest owned black business in the history of the United States. It developed more jobs and was successful for more businessmen and entrepreneurs than any other business in the United States. The history of the Negro League it was actually born in Babylon, New York, a place called uh, the Argyle Hotel. It was the Duke of Borough who in fact built this 750 room resort to entertain its guests by the Negro League players. It was actually two amateur teams that came together and became the Cuban X Giants. This team, uh, what they basically did was uh, they didn't want to be identified as Afro-Americans. So they wanted to be known as a team from another country. So they changed their names to the Cuban X Giants. One of the things I like to explain is the fact that in the early days, this is where the foundation was laid for the actual Negro Leagues. It was uh, a situation where 75% of the ball players were college graduates. So if you can envision uh, an owner having to deal with 15, 16 Michael Jordans on the team, he had to be very strong, will, strong-minded, and very capable of dealing with those type of uh, athletes. So as we know, Major League Baseball really mirrored the accommodations of the Negro League. What happens is a lot of the things that happened to develop the league, it came about through necessity. For example, a situation where uh, a player would come in with high spikes and, and rip the, 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 the uniforms or tear the legs of the players from the Negro League, so they decided to do something about it. So they took a barrel, a whiskey barrel, broke it down, tied it under their uniforms to protect themselves from being spiked by the white counterparts. The other part of that is we invented the shin guard, the face masks, okay, night baseball. Barnstorming, barnstorming came about by teams that were basically traveling teams that would travel from city to city to play all challengers. And this was one of the mainstays of the uh, Negro Leagues as far as making money. What happens is they would uh, come to a city and maybe play one, two, maybe even three games going into the twilight. So there was a need for lights. So at this time, the entrepreneurs came together and invented uh, the telescopic lights that they would take from game to game. And they uh, built these on the back of uh, trucks and they were able to put them up for any night game that came about. Uh, this happened 10 years before Major League Baseball embraced night baseball. They felt that it was something that would work, but they saw that economically the Negro Leagues were so innovative and some of the ideas and things that they created that they had to mirror them later as far as to keep their leagues going to make money. Uh, one of the things that uh, uh, is well known about the success of the, the, the teams were the fact that these players were very intelligent. Rube Foster helped develop this league and also one of his innovative uh, feats was the fact that he put together the so-called East-West All-Star team and uh, they had an All-Star game in the 1924s. This is before Major League Baseball even had an All-Star game. So you can see that these guys were innovative. They had a, a, a really large attendance uh, of about 35, 40,000 people. So if you can envision at a dollar a ticket back in the 20s what kind of money these black owners were actually commanding at that time. Uh, when we go back to the Gentleman's Agreement, it started early in the late 1800s. And basically what that agreement was to keep Negroes out of baseball. 
and it was for the sole purpose of fear and racism that was the main reason that you know the Negro players were kept out of baseball. If you can imagine, if the owner would take would have uh, taken his time and really developed his players to allow them to play with the Negro Leaguers or just say, look, simply, you know, I'm not going to pay you if you don't play against these guys. It's about baseball. It's not about racism. If they had took that stand, we never would have had this problem and Jackie Robinson would not have been considered the first ball player black in Major League Baseball. Okay. Here we have pictures of uh, some of the owners from the Negro League, Ed Bo, uh, Bolden and J.L. Wilkins. Wilkinson. Now J.L. Wilkinson is white. He was very instrumental in the Negro Leagues in a lot of ways. He was the main person that put up the money to develop the lighting system for them to play during the barnstorming era. Uh, he also was noted to have before he had the Kansas City Monarchs, he had two All Nations teams, which they were traveling teams that Barnstorm that were made up of uh, Asian Americans, uh, American Indians, blacks, and whites playing on the same team. And this actually started around the 1900s. Okay, here again we have Rube Fossil. As you can see, he was a very dapper, dressed person which all of the Negro Leaguers were known for their ability to, to dress well and set the trend for uh, America. Basically, uh, Ruth Foster was a great organizer. One of his main slogans was that we are a ship and all else is a sea, which basically meant that we just ride out whatever we had to do outside of the, the, the integration situation and just make the best of it. And that's exactly what he did. Economically, he brought a lot of money to the community. And this is something uh, that people do not understand. It's the fact that Major League Baseball had to disenfranchise the Negro Leagues. It was not so much taking the players, but to disenfranchise the owners. Because they did not want to be second to the Negro League owners. This is uh, actually a photograph of Ephraim Manning. She was one of the most innovative owners of her period in time. She was also noted for a very big civil rights worker and campaign against uh, the anti-lynching law. Epi Manley was actually a white person that her mother married a black, uh, black man and he was a stepfather. She was raised in a black community and she went on to marry a black gentleman herself, a Manley, who was known for the numbers rack, shows she was actually the co-owner of the Newark Eagles. Being a uh, former baseball player myself, to be able to go to Cooperstown and witness this induction was just, it was the height of my, my, my career. A lot of the Negro League players uh, played their winter ball in the Dominican, Cuba, and Venezuela. Also, uh, early part of the, the Winter Leagues was played in California itself. But uh, if you can envision, uh, going back to the early days, the Negro Leaguers were under contract with a lot of your major hotels. For example, in Palm Beach, Orlando, Florida, uh, during the turn of the century, there were big hotels that would actually have them under contract to entertain their guests. And uh, this is where a lot of the barnstorming came about, uh, traveling and playing against all oncomers that they would take games against. I just had the opportunity uh, last week to, to speak at Cooperstown. Uh, at one of the unveilings of the Satchel Page uh, bronze statue, and I was able to meet some of the families of the people that's on this wall, like uh, Blue Papa Bell, uh, uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Hart, uh Lou Sotos, Ms. Mackey, uh, Ted W. Ted Duke Rector, Buck uh, O'Neill, and you have to envision that these players are inducted into the Hall of Fame because of their merit and the way 
really conducted themselves on the field. Uh, this is the first time that they have inducted a number of uh, 17 players at one time. Normally it's three to four players per year. But this time, this induction was 17 players representing the Negro Leagues. Now one player was Bruce Suttles, which was a uh, white uh, ball player from Major League Baseball. The other was Effa Manley and uh, J.L. Wilkinson. They were the only two whites. The others were Negro League players. And these players, you know, it's been a long time coming. And this is a need to recognize for uh, these players. They were players that were recognized from the period of uh, the pre-Negro Baseball League and also the Negro League period. One of the things that really touched me was the fact that I was able to speak to and interact with a lot of these players' families. One of the most touching uh, segments of the, the induction was the fact that uh, they unveiled a uh, statue of Satchel Page. Uh, at this uh, unveiling, Ham, his daughter, spoke, and she uh, she really took him to church. She basically uh, she had a sermon about uh, them bones, you know, coming to life. And, and and basically what it was saying is, after all these years, we're now receiving recognition for the things that we should have received years ago. So it was really uh, very heartwarming to see the reception of the players and their families as they were being inducted into all the fans. This is Leroy Cooper at the California Apple American Museum at Exposition Park. And we welcome you to come out and enjoy this exhibit because it is free and open to the public.